Welcome to our channel, everyone. Today, we're inside of the Orlando store. I'm standing in front of the 1500 gallon tank. It's right behind me. We've been doing updates, me and Josh, on all the display tanks. I hope you guys have been enjoying them. And today, I'm gonna grab Josh, and I'm gonna be showing you guys this 1500 gallon tank. So follow me along for more information. Let's go get Josh. Josh, we're back at it again, buddy. Dang, this is like the fourth tank. Yeah, I, was, I told everyone in the intro that we've been, we've been doing the recap on all of our display tanks. We did the Pentagon, we did Tank 12, which is a 750. We did the 4 and 500, which is a 900 gallon system. Yep. Now we're going, we're diving into Casper's home. <laughs> this is uh, all reliable, right? Yeah, all reliable. So again, this tank was set up. We're gonna post pictures for you guys of the build out. This tank has been set up now for four years, four years and a few months. Yep. We're constantly fragging out of this tank mm -hmm. and we're gonna get ready to slow down the fragging because we got all the display tanks that are taking off like wildfire. And we gotta look good for Reef of Palooza. Yeah, it's true. No shame on our game, you know. We got a lot of people coming from out of town. Everybody wants to stop by Reef of Palooza. You guys know coming in to Orlando on April 21st and April 22nd this year is the 10 year anniversary. So we expect a lot of people here in the store. I mean, usually it's our busiest weekend, you know? So we want everyone to enjoy the eye candy and get to see all the, the goodies that we have that we've been brewing for a while, you know? Right, yep, this is the best our corals have ever looked. And then you also told me we did some electrical work, so we're able to turn the lights a little higher now. So if you remember, we switched from the Gen 4s to the Gen 6s on this tank. So when we switched to the Gen 6s, we were running into electrical issues. Um, they run on the same power supply, but we were, because they, they spread the light more as a blanket yeah. rather than so focal, we actually had to turn the intensities up. Oh, because it wasn't penetrating as much as you wanted Correct. it to before. So it's the same 22 lights that we've always had on the tank. Okay. Um, well, we turned them up. That being said, we didn't realize we were like right at the peak of our capacity in the electrical circuit. So we were turning like one off here and one off there because they were actually popping the breakers. And then we noticed once we crank them up, we start seeing better growth. We need a little extra power because the tank is super deep. Yeah, that's why we have 22 lights on it too. Yeah, so for yeah. those of you guys watching at home, this tank is exactly 1500 gallon tank. Yep. It is 110 inches long or 10, 10 foot panel. Oh, 10, because it's, uh, it's exactly 10. It's exactly it's 10. It's exactly 10 foot long, five feet deep, and exactly 48 inches tall. Yep. And this is our deepest tank in house right now, and oops, the uh -huh. fish just delivered some food. <laughs> when that fish is so big, when he goes to the bathroom, it's food for everyone. Coral fish, no discrimination here. So when we first set up the tank, and we know we're, we never done a tank more than 36 inches tall, and we went with this one four feet tall, and we were actually questioning if radians were gonna be able to penetrate the whole depth, right? Correct. So originally we had four less. We actually ended up putting two on the end here and two on the end here, kind of coming down at an angle. Okay. So from its original iteration to now, there's four more lights. Which is 22. 22 lights. Yep. And flow is still the same since day one. It is only three Pentarays E63 EMC. E yeah, Pantaray ECM 63. ECM, ECM yep. 63 Pantaray. They are fantastic powerheads. They're, very, they're for very large applications. I said if your fish tank is no seven, 800 gallon tank, you still, it might be a little too much for your tank, right? Yeah, I think I think for when we're talking about these powerheads, you're talking about traveling depth. Linear right? flow, right? Yeah, so laminar flow. Laminar flow. Laminar flow. So the idea is that these have like a torpedo application the flow comes out rifled, so it travels further through the water column. So the one thing that you get out of this powerhead versus like a Vortec or a Gyre is it doesn't hit the end of the wall and then just go splat, right? These, they hit the other side and they just like circle around and come back. With all the growth, we haven't had any issues with the flow. We haven't had necessity to add more. No, because we can still turn them up. Oh, so you don't have them all, all the way up? Well, they're, so some of them reach 100%, but it's only for an interval. So it's a short interval of high intensity. So that's why we get that really strange movement in the water. And if you watch, it's it's strong some sometimes here, yeah. and sometimes it's strong down there. I see. This power head in the front, all right. it's similar to what I talk about a lot. It, when, we're, when we're trying to deliver flow in a tank, 
we want one power head that does the most of the work. So this one here is on the longest interval of peak intensity. I see the bottom power has got a lot of algae mm -hmm. and you, we have a case over. So they're not as big as bulky. You can run them without this. It's called the honeycomb case. Is that yeah, right? I, Something I'm not sure what lines. they call it, but that's what but we But it looks call like it. a honeycomb case. It's like a, like a case that it goes over it. So snails don't go in there because the power is just too strong. Yep. And I noticed that the bottom one has got a lot of algae. Do you feel like that would restrict the flow an extra additional percentage? Of certain, uh, some kind? Yeah, I think any power head that gets dirty, you definitely lose efficacy. The biggest thing here with these, we're not using them at their peak potential. So even if it does lose a little bit, we're not stressed over it. But definitely there's a drop. There for sure is. And so for someone at home, you recommend the power heads is something they should clean more regular than not. I think anybody who takes care of their equipment is gonna see the benefit because your equipment will take care of you. Gotcha. It's an old thing that my grandfather used to say, take care of your tools, your tools take care of you. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, because sure. first of all, we're in a saltwater world. Things deteriorate really bad. Since you're talking about mm -hmm. that, we have roughly 300 lights in the farm and mm -hmm. we have somebody going around on schedule Mm -hmm. Climbing on top of the lights, dusting them, getting all the dust, cleaning the yep. fans, literally one by one, all 300 lights. Yep. We go and we clean all 300 fans, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's on a six month interval. Okay. But yeah. But I'm saying they go on a schedule. Every single one gets cleaned, and that's because we want them to last. These lights, they get hot. You know, if they can't cool, their life expectancy drops tremendously. But it's been lasting pretty well for us. Amazingly, yeah. They're so there you go. Course. Good maintenance just is, is translating to good equipment for you to last, for the equipment to last longer. Yep. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the fish. Bubbles drives me crazy. <laughs> Tell me what's the deal is with him. Well, he'll draw blood. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. When you go to feed, he's the first one to your hand, and he's he's not delicate about it at all. He's definitely in our top three biggest fish in-house. I don't know how you pronounce that. It's Mata, M-A-T-A. Mata, Mata, Mata Tang. Yeah, cancerous Mata. So my question is, you think he's bigger than the Villaminja over there or roughly the same size? He weighs more. Uh, yeah, I would say he looks like to be our biggest fish. You could probably fillet him. Just joking. Hey, we got a sushi spot next door. Pretty good food, by the way. If you ever come to <laughs> Worldwide Corals, it's called Sushi Kichi next door. Yep. I'm giving him a shout out. Japanese guy cooking Japanese food, authentic. Him, his wife. There's a whole family thing. Go check them out. Really good food. All right, so we got the big Mata Tank. Yep. You got the big Unicorn and the Villaminji. And I'm going to have to brag about this. I told you and a few other people that the biggest fish that was going to grow in here was the Villaminji. And people told me no, it was going to be the Unicorn. And I, I, I didn't want to argue because, guys, I know my fish, but I'm not a fish expert by any means. I don't claim to be. I never have. And I never kept a Unicorn because you need very large tanks, you know? Mm -hmm. So... It kind of slowed down a little bit. Like, what, what do you think happened to him? Well, it could be a dominance factor. You know, fish fish of more dominance tend to produce a growth hormone. It does feel that way. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe, maybe he slowed down, but maybe he's going to catch back up too. Sure. You never know. We have a black tank. Yep. We got the zebra tank. How, how old is that black tank now? 15 15 years. years. No, going into 16, 2008. That's crazy, man. I that purchased and sold that fish twice, and that fish... That fish is so bulletproof. That fish has got an egg. And when I tell you it's got an egg, have you guys seen egg that is so bad that you can see it just hanging on the body and the fish just looks white and the fish is just like having trouble swimming? That fish bit that twice. So that fish is bulletproof. For those watching at home, Josh, uh -huh. break down the difference between a convict tank and a zebra tank. Because at first glance, you're like, oh, that's a convict tank. Far so, from it. Yeah, convicts are one of the most prolific fish out there. This fish is uh, it's a Mauritian zebra tang, so it's considered a cancerous polyzona. Very uh, aggressive, right? Yeah, he's got an attitude for sure. They get bigger than your normal convict tang, and because they're only found, or they're, they're primarily endemic to that southeastern region of Africa, you don't see them a lot. So, real quick, so we were talking about the black tang, mm -hmm. and it's worth mentioning that we have the black tang, we have two yellow tanks, and we have Casper, world famous Casper. Our mascot has been with us since uh, August 2010. So that fish literally is, this, this summer is gonna be 14 years since it's been with us. He was actually a lot smaller. Um, the reason why we did that, I wanted to have the contrast of a black tank, a white tank, and a solid yellow tank. And I think it worked pretty well because it's cool to show someone at home 
three solid colors and such a palatable colors, right? Mm -hmm. Like you got yeah. a white, you got a black, even and though black is not a, a color, tank. right? And, and then you wear a gem tank, you know, which I've never been a fan of gem tanks. I never understand why they're worth so much money, especially in the past. They can go down on price now, mm -hmm. but I always think they're ugly, especially when they get kind of big. You got Stormtrooper Pearl Clowns. From I Pro see. Aquatics. You're from Pro Aquatics. Banga Cardinals. Banga Cardinals, where? I don't see them. There's one right there. Okay, I see them right back there. And I there's see a couple one. that hang out. How so they turn out like in nature. So that's something cool to talk about. When I was with Ryan and we were talking about uh, fish at Reef Palooza in Texas. Yeah. We talked about chromis and how they hang out in the Acroporas. So this is like the most natural reef slope you can find in an aquarium. All those Acropora right there are literally just like in the wild where yeah. all those, those reef fish, they live in the Acropora colonies and they come out to feed. And then when they get stressed, they go back to those That's how colonies. they get that protection. Because mm -hmm. the big fish can poke through those Acropora that will get hurt if they do. Yeah, so you almost can't even tell that the Cardinals are there. That covers all the fish, right? Oh, you we got one more. You talk about the orange shoulder. That's, one more. That's the biggest orange, sto old that orange shoulder that's still yellow. If you guys know about orange shoulders, that's the coral when they're juvenile. Mm -hmm. When they turn into adults, they're supposed to change. That fish has been here all four years. We haven't introduced new tanks in here. So it's really cool. That fish was yellow when he went in. He didn't have the orange bar. Huh. He turned gray with the orange bar, and then something happened. I don't know if it's a dominance hierarchy thing, but it he went back be, right? to yellow, and he kept the orange bar. It could be because of the environment. The tank is big, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of tanks in here, and they're pretty big. And yep. it's, it's funny you say, we don't seem to have a true pecking order on this thing. It seems like they get along pretty well, and they don't seem to be as, I mean, I'm. If I have to take a wild guess, I couldn't even tell you who I would think would be the dominant. Well, the dominant one is the Mata Tang, but I only think that's because of size. I think when it comes to aggression, the Zebra Tang is the number zebra. two. Yeah. Got you. So Josh, I'm looking at these corals right now. They look phenomenal. What a better way. It's been a long time. I haven't climbed up there again. We've been super busy. Why don't we go to the back of the time? Let's climb up there. Show me. Let's put some blue lights. Let's just, let's dive up there and let's stop the flow and let's enjoy it. Sure. All right, Love let's it. Go. Let's do it. What are those Sunny D's Zoanthus over there? Gobstoppers and Sunny D's. Oh my gosh. That patch right there looks freaking ridiculous, dude. And then that colony of paleta pink tip in the front. Dude, that paleta pink tip. And what is that tennis, that blue one right below us right there? This one. Cobalt. Yeah. Cobalt? Cobalt. Wow. Old school. And then this giant freaking stack, that's the Salomon split. Yep. And then right behind it, you see that millipore, if you can point it, Josh. That right there, that's the Rouge Millie. Is that what I think it is? Yeah. Is that the Cosmic Bounce, the best one we have ever seen? Yeah, that's our Cosmic Candy. It literally looks like we took crayons and melted so them dude, together. We, this is no Photoshop. We're literally watching it live here. That thing is insane. I cannot believe what my eyes are seeing. These Recordias, they're freaking insane, dude. I can't believe it. It's cool. Most of the time we put Recordia in lower light and think that that's where they belong. That's the one we call Hippie Juice. Hippie juice, mm -hmm. OMG, dude, the blue coming out with the pink and the peach, yellowish. It's, it's a lot like the confetti, but it's a little bit better. The polyps are way more gold. Wow, dude, it's looking simply incredible, man. I'm loving it. Look at the colony of Yoda Zoant that's down there. All the way on the front over there? Yeah, look at it. Dude, With the blue incredible. centers? Those are Yodas? Yeah, those are Yodas. And what do you got right on top of it? Those are the ones that Grandmaster Craig? Yep, gym case. What do you call that tenuous? It looks... This is sabotage. Do I need a piece of that on my tank? For sure you and do. And this Millie here, it was dying or something? It came back? Is that why it's got gold everywhere? No, that was getting beat up by the flow really bad. So we moved it up here at the top. Okay, I got you. Don't sleep on this. This is actually... I have it on my tank. It's, it's, a, it's a really thick branch. It's a, uh, what do they call that? Um, um, no, it's not what you're thinking. Yes, it is. That's a, uh, that's the one we call prom queen. Yeah, but I got on my tank, but you're it's thinking. It's abertinoides. That is an abertinoides? Yes. Okay, it's growing on my tank very well, and I love the color of the core. I love it, I love it. Is that what I think it is, a grafted <laughs> torch? Yeah, that's the one and only. All right, that's beautiful. Well, that's, that's our mother colony right down there. You guys can see it. It's have a uh, gold. In the goal and half a uh, holy grail. This green slimer here is so common, but growing against the glass, people mention it to us all the time. I mean, look at this beauty, guys. I mean, it's just so sturdy. You guys can see right here, it's attached completely to the glass. I actually, came off a little bit of the glass. That's funny, I can feel my pinky in the back. Can you guys see the flat piece right there? Look at this yellow shot right here. I mean, this aquapora right here is just nuts. 
I mean, this thing is about to cover the entire overflow, and that overflow is not a small overflow, Josh, by any means. No. I want to say it's a 20-inch overflow, if not more. It's 24. The, the overflow is 24 by I eight. mean, look at that, guys. I mean, that aquaporer is literally growing that big. What do you call this, Josh? Swamp thing? Swamp thing, yep. How many are there? At least 20, and these things are just growing like weeds back there. I love it, man. I just like how the bubbles get so big in multiple colors. It looks incredible. And here we got the branches that first year. It's got some bubble algae or some algae growing in between. Yeah. It's just, the problem that we're having, guys, this thing is it's getting so overgrown. You guys can see the type of coral warfare that we're dealing with here. That it's just some corals, that they just don't get the right flow in certain spots. And that's a plant, that, that's a perfect example right there. It's a lot like a natural environment. I mean, you're not gonna go out in the wild and see a perfect coral every time you look at it. I'm glad we went mixed, because as beautiful as an FPS tank is, it's cool to see those zoanthids right there, that, that combo zoanthids growing into the rock, right in part with the recording that could pour at the very top of the tank. Yeah, I agree. It's like, it, it is, just like I said, it's like a natural environment. Yeah. You have, you have reef slopes, you have the depth, you have the really bright light, you have some of the lower light, you have diffused flow, you have strong flow. I'm thinking I'm thinking we talk about placement a little bit because we're you're not gonna just go and put a coral in the tank. All of those ganis, all of those euphilia, they're kind of down in the ravine. Okay. Right? You wouldn't just put them right here at the top of the tank. No, and then something else worth mentioning right here, I, I, I think well, something that I'm gonna recommend, we got three aquapores. It's a print table in acro. Mm -hmm. There's the, I wanna say, Joe Joe Dirt, and then I wanna say Greg Carroll's acro. That's exactly right. Yeah, man, I'm getting, I'm getting decent at this name. So we got all three of these acros right here and they're literally collecting packets of dirt that I, I'm gonna show you guys with the camera in a minute when we go in there. And that might be a better area for a coral that it can take higher nutrients because the acropora, literally where the dirt lands, it's gonna die. It's literally gonna create a packet where the coral's not gonna grow. The coral won't die altogether. That's specific, so this is my hand here, and this is a packet of dirt right there. That specific area where the dirt lands, is gonna die. Yep. These packets are there, I'm gonna blow the dirt. Can you guys see? Can you guys see where the coral has been collecting just there? And it's almost embedded in there because it's been happening so long. It almost became like a part of a rock. The coral died and it's just, same right here, if I can point. There's Joe Dirt. You guys, you see how that dirt went flying? So that's what we don't want on Acropora. If an Acropora is getting dirt settling on it, you don't have the right flow, you don't have the right spot where you're put in the right position. Yep. All right, so Josh, we just came back from the top. Looks phenomenal, dude. I know. I'm so excited to look at everything. Yeah, it's been a while, man. I should do this more often, but so much going on around here, you know? So I know you're busy. We got a lot going on. I know you got a couple meetings you got to get into. Couple more questions. Maintenance on this tank. Weekly water changes, I'm assuming? Yeah, so this is a copy and paste to pretty much every other tank that we have here. We do regular weekly water changes. The only exception is this one gets a monster water change. Okay, and we use Brightwell Salt as well we on this one? We use Brightwell Salt. And he does about 30% of this tank. 30%? It's a right. lot. And then we got Joey, Lou's brother. He's in charge of uh, maintenance with Skyler. Mm -hmm. And he dives this tank once a week? Yeah, he goes in this tank once a week. We move things that we need to move. We clean things that we need to clean. You know, it's it's really just about touching each and every part of it every time that we're in there. In numbers, are a little bit different than other tanks as far as like uh, calcium, alkalinity. No, nope, these are all the same. The only the only exception here, so calcium is always going to be around 400 or, or a little okay. bit higher. Magnesium is going to be right around 1400. Okay. Um, alkalinity in this one is going to be right around nine. Okay. Our acceptable range on elk is always between eight and nine. And nitrates? That's the high one. That's why we do such a big water change. So the, this one here is consistently 20, sometimes more. I think the biggest thing, you suggested a couple times over, maybe we go with a bigger skimmer. That might be the best course of action here, because I don't think that that one's really cutting it. So we're still fragging this tank every week? Every single week. So with the new 4,000 gallon system coming, it's gonna get a little of a break. The colonies are fairly large. I mean, there are some giant colonies in here, mm -hmm. but I still wanna see a little more growth. Unfortunately, this is a working display for us, so we do take a lot of frags out of it, but yeah, 100%. If we yeah. can make them a lot more full, I think that from the viewing perspective in the store, everybody would appreciate it more. Cool. So Josh, last but not least, mm -hmm. you got here a couple half scolies. I'm gonna tell people a little story about this. This was scolies that they weren't doing good, and when they're not fragging them, and now they're coming back. How long does it take for a little frag of Escolimia to come back? So they, they bounce back really quick. So the skin will come over the edge, but it doesn't 
form a full donut shape for at least six months. Six months. Yeah, and even then, if you still turn it over with all that big round flesh, you still see the half moon shape. So it could take a good year. I don't know how long the skeleton takes to develop, but you can make it look like a full skull in six months. Gotcha, cool. So for everyone watching at home, if you have a beautiful tank that you want us to come and film, very easy, send us an email, tell us, hey, I want you to come film my tank. Send us the information, if the tank is beautiful, we'll be more than glad to come and check it out. However, in the next two to three weeks, we're gonna be in the Atlanta, Georgia area. So please, if you have a beautiful tank, you want us to film it, contact us, we'll be glad to stop by your house. If you happen to be international in another country, no worries, we're gonna be doing tours international here very soon. Just send us the information. Well, Josh, thank you for your time, buddy. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, Casper Home. Come see him next time you're in town. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Give us a like, post some comments below. We'll see you guys soon.